Thanks for the opportunity today. We want to talk about this question a little differently. We often talk about successful schools. I'd like to talk about the systems that actually encourage, create, and maintain urban public school failure. There is a harsh reality that it is no accident that nationally that there are failing schools. And in most cases, it's been these same schools that have been failing for years. It's not a surprise. And for the sake of argument, I want to date it back to 1983. Ronald Reagan, when he was trying to get reelected, realized that education was going to be a key for his campaign, and he commissioned a report called A Nation at Risk. In this report, there is a quote that says, if, a, if our current public education system was, a po was imposed upon us by a foreign power, it would be considered an act of war. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> if our current education system was imposed upon us by a foreign power, it would be considered an act of war. Now, while this was a polemic and was written off in that way, it still shows that there was lots of questions about how education was going to work and what it truly meant for us. So, since 1983, I think we have to all accept, if you will, that there have been a lot of important people, smart thinkers, and finances invested to work with these schools, yet still, some of these schools have continued to fail. So why? Well, if the driving question of the last generation has been, why do schools fail, I think it is time that we change the question. So let me run these by you. Number one, what role do failing schools play in the functioning of a school district? Second question, what systems maintain their status? And third, why do districts endorse, be it implicitly or explicitly, these systems and continued school failure? So who am I to ask such questions? First of all, yes, I am one of those alt-cert people, meaning in that I come at this a little differently, and maybe that's part of the exposure that comes with it. And I'm very good at failure. I have worked at some of the lowest performing schools in the country. In Baltimore City, I was at the, one of the lowest performing schools, middle schools in Maryland. If you've seen The Wire, that's my school. Um, we wear that with pride. In Philadelphia, I worked at the, one of the lowest performing high schools. It was also rated one of the most dangerous schools in the state. If you've seen The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the opening scenes are my high school. And currently, I'm at the Academy at Shawnee that was at one time rated the lowest performing school in the state of Kentucky. So again, I'm good at failure. Um, Remind you of our three questions. Now let's see what happens. Now, there are a few simple but powerful systems that create and sustain failure. And sometimes it's got nothing to do with the people at all. Think about the time at which we stopped building schools out of wood and moved to concrete and mortar. Now, some of you are here thinking, oh, great, green environmental ed. We're going to get that involved in natural light. No, no, that's much simpler than that. I'm sorry for you hippies like me. That's another conversation. When we stopped building schools out of wood and we moved to concrete and mortar, we lost the ability to burn them down. <laughs> and you know as well as I, the firebug and all of us might actually hit those. <laughs> Secondly, the names of schools matter. Think of a community that has a school called Lower Heights. And we all know in mainstream that Lower Heights is the area of town you stay away from. What is your association going to be with the school that is named Lower Heights Elementary or Lower Heights Middle? or lower heights high. If you don't spend time in that area, your perceptions are simply going to be transferred onto that school no matter what's going on in that building. And related to that is location. When in fact mainstream society has divided up cities and divided up sections and created certain schools in certain areas, and we know, boy, that area is something place that you don't go into, and we rely on information from others to tell us about that area, we quickly make the same association with that area. And many times, it is our failing schools that are in the most isolated parts of town. You can go from my schools in West Baltimore, West Philadelphia, and West Louisville, and realize that in those areas, there's not a lot of reasons for mainstream society to spend there. There's no entertainment. There's no restaurant. There's no movie theaters. And most instances, these in specifics, there is an expressway that if you're traveling west, you can drive around that area and never have to go through it or be part of it. This simply helps to continue the reputations that go on. All right, let's look at a couple more complex options. First, of course, there's the role of the media. We always want to blame the media, but that is not necessarily the case. In fact, the media isn't always the problem, and it's often errant to lump it all together. And I'll list for you a few folks as journalists and production people who've done amazing work to promote the important parts of education. But there are those occasions when, in fact, the media can be a major force in creating and reinforcing reputations of schools. In fact, at West Philadelphia High School, the television companies would always broadcast anything related to West Philadelphia from the steps of my school. A church that was on fire two blocks away, a death, a car accident three a mile away, so forth. We were the geographic marker of all things bad, whether it had to do with the school or not. 
So if you, again, are watching TV and you see this continuously done, it does, in fact, hurt. So there's no doubt the shelf life of good news is far less than the aftertaste of bad news. And so the media can have a role. Now, market theory. This is my stretch to try and impress my old professor of economics, and I think I've got this right. In education, school choice is the manifestation of market theory because market theory and school choice creates competition. Now, we're most familiar with school choice nationally in the creation of magnet schools. And magnet schools were initially designed to stem white flight out of their urban areas. Now, when you create choice, you create competition. And when you create competition, folks choosing one school over another, you are creating winners and losers. Now, if it's Best Buy and Circuit City, we realize that one is now out of business. The same is true when we create school choice. There are those schools that will attract students and those schools that do not. And then the ones that do not are going to struggle more. So let's talk about this invisible hand of school choice for a second. Do magnet schools take the higher achieving students? This is what we often want to believe, and it's not true. In fact, magnet schools or any school of choice doesn't cream for ability. It skims instead for families that value education and are actively involved in the choice process. The two sites at the bottom of the screen are where you can find additional data for this. The High School and Beyond data set explains this clearly. And even if you look at Jeffrey Cannon's work in the Harlem Children's Zone, he will be able to tell you that he didn't get his performance gains in that area until he made his schools schools of choice. So when you have this correlation, you then create this uneven playing field. You have schools that families actively involved in the education process are working to send their children, and then you have schools whose families are not able to take advantage of that choice process for any series of real reasons. So then what happens? Who's actually attending these failing schools, or even more dangerously said, who are failing schools for? These are schools that have higher concentrations of poverty, special education, and adjudication. And it is, in fact, more often that these families aren't able to prioritize education in the same way that more of our mainstream families can. It is not a lack of desire, it is not a lack of commitment, but sometimes it's just about the education processes, information available, and understanding why this is so important. So there's a semantic side effect that's a fun one to talk about too. If you go to a magnet school and you struggle, be it academically or behaviorally, and you leave that school, you are called a transfer. If you go to a failing school, let's say, or any other public school that's not a school of choice, and you struggle academically or you struggle behaviorally and you leave that school, you're called a dropout. And in Louisville, when you go from being a dropout in a high school, let's say, and you go and enroll in a GED program to work towards that, what are you called there? Dropout, until you finish the degree. So sometimes even the semantics of how we describe both the failure and the folks involved simply continue these systems that are at play. All right. So we've talked about a few of these. They're a little more comfortable and fun, We've a little more edgy. Then there's the third rail. So let's talk about the third rail of the systems. <laughs> there are a bunch of these, and we'll go through each one of these individually. OK, let's first talk about student assignment. Now, this is an issue that impacts districts nationally. It's not just in Jefferson County and Louisville. It's obviously a hot topic here. But think about the Lower Heights example. If it's an area of town we're not familiar with, and we're able to create schools over there for those kids, then student assignment is very important to maintain balance. If we market share is always a big deal for districts because based upon the number of people enrolled in your district is about how much money you get coming into your district. And if all of a sudden we mess up or mess around with student assignment and some of our kids are now with those kids and some of those kids are with our kids, there is the perception that there will be a migration of folks to parochial, private, or those folks who can vote with their feet and move out of the county. So oftentimes we maintain these systems in order to maintain market share. Political capital. The urban ten, the, excuse me, the average tenure of an urban superintendent is under four years. Now, if you wish to maintain your career and extend a little further, you have to work to garner enough political capital that be it an elected board or a community or a city wishes to see you in that office longer. Where do you garner political capital? From those schools that serve mainstream society, because those are the folks who have the time to invest in, be it voting, communication, community meetings, and so forth. So if you're trying to extend your tenure, there is a natural inclination to serve those mainstream schools more often than failing schools. You get more from it. Even if your long-term goal is to get to those failing schools, you have to stay in power long enough to be able to do that. And so you have to keep serving mainstream in order to get to the ones that are struggling. This one's less popular. Please don't tell my boss. All right. We have had major high-stakes accountability systems since 1983. 
And by high stakes meaning that if in fact you struggled or failed, there were real punishments, the whole carrot and stick, and the stick has been real. And in most cases, there has been removal of principals, transferring of teachers, reassigning of adults, so forth, all school-based. How many district personnel in any of these systems have been held directly accountable? Few, if any. Well, why is that? First, it's very difficult to determine the value added or deleted by a district personnel when they, in fact, are serving more than just that school. There is also a sense of ascribed credibility by reaching central office, that because you must be an expert to get there, so this can't be your fault. And you see this even in the language of reports that are created. If you're in a failing school, goodness knows there's a thousand documents that must be printed, and often out of these accountability reports, there are things that say what the school will do and what the school must do. And they often then also do an assessment of districts, because in fact it's all part of a system, and the language in the same reports, school will, school must, District could, district should. Those as well continue to create not an uneven playing field and possibly an unequal system even within the same environment. Contain struggling staff. Sometimes, the stereo, sometimes there's truth in stereotype. And yes, there have been times at which some of our lowest performing personnel have been assigned or locked into some of our lowest performing schools because they stand out less is the belief. That if in fact you've had systems that the school has struggled, there's been a mix of folks there, those families and families, because they're not able to be as actively involved and not able to be as vocal about their schools, often accept the idea that they're a second class school and therefore this person doesn't really seem as bad as the others. Now blame for this is shared widely. It can either be the principal that didn't do the appropriate discipline or coaching of that teacher in his or her early parts of his career. It could be a teacher's union that maybe said the weakest link that we can protect is a little too low and they allow that to happen. Or it could be a district that was hiding something. So there's shared responsibility, but it continues to maintain the system of failing schools. Now, if in fact you're a teacher or a principal and you're thinking about longevity, longevity of your career, do you now seek out opportunities to work in those schools? There are those of us who are idiots that think, oh goodness, I'm going to be the one that saves it. And then we wake up and realize that maybe that's a problem. But more often than not, if you want a long career, and you know that this is a school that's going to be in hot water, and you might get turned over or removed or so forth, there's not a lot of incentive to be able to move into that environment. In fact, you're jeopardizing and risking a great deal more. So what do these schools then become? The farm clubs of the good schools. New teachers then become the preponderance of teachers at our failing schools. And when they cut their teeth there and they show to be great success, other schools are watching. And then they get to say, I tell you what, I love the way you teach math. And if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. I've got the right classroom for you. It'll be a little less stress on you daily and you will have a long, prosperous career. So in many cases, it is the failing schools that become the farm clubs for other schools. Shameless plug. This doesn't have to be the case. Check out our story in Education Week and you'll see that this is not, that we can debunk the myth about experienced, talented teachers going into failing schools and being successful. All right, this one scares me the most. Progress allows inaction. In Baltimore, I wrote a 400-page school improvement plan that kept our school from being privatized to revolutionize that school. Eight years later, nothing had happened. School closed, eventually became a charter school, and it's still now functioning, but completely wiped off the map. In Philadelphia, we did major reorganization, huge funding from the William Penn Foundation, a series of other pilot programs. Eight to 10 years later, the school is closed, and they've built a new school a number of miles away. In Louisville, a reconfiguration plan for what was then Shawnee High School. Major conversion efforts, efforts a 7-0 vote, unanimous from the Board of Education. And still to this day, we have yet to have that plan. In fact, that plan is dead, and we're waiting to see what happens next. Way too often, when we start these turnaround efforts, when we start to rebuild schools, a little good news, unfortunately, allows the people paying attention to say, don't have to worry about that. I'm going back to work over on these things over here. When in fact, it should be exactly this. This is where I get to try and be famous. That progress must be seen as a moral imperative to act, not as an excuse for inaction. And way too often, it's the reverse. When we start to get good news, that's when you make the tough decisions, when everyone can happily say, let's move from here. Because when you do it, when it's bad news and failure, it sounds like an act of desperation. OK. Lots of folks, especially around here, the charter school conversation in Kentucky is hot. And we like to think that this is the answer. Well, maybe. Are they the answer? not by themselves, because charter schools are in fact the next evolution of school choice and market theory. Charter schools, you must apply to a charter school, which therefore means in that skimming process, we will skim even more into those schools. Will more kids be successful? Maybe, but it can't be a comprehensive solution in and of itself. 
So let's talk about some other parts that we might be able to make it work with. First, the idea of a charter school is that it is an independent school that answers directly to the state, a charter. So it is removed allegedly from a lot of the bureaucracy and red tape and the ills that we associate with public school systems. So that also means, that also means it becomes the research and development arm. That if you remove some of these barriers and performance changes, can a district learn from those systems and say this is how we need to evolve? So R&D can be a critical part of charter school systems. And then secondly, we must develop a whole new accountability system. Because right now, the only rewards in the system are in fact getting students to perform at proficiency, which absolutely is the goal for all of us. But as we skim families away from the system or from all of our schools that can be actively involved in the education process and you see the higher concentrations of students in need, it's not an even playing field. And in fact, with those combination of factors will tell you quite clearly these kids should drop out of high school or will drop out of high school and here's when they will drop out. So maybe we need a two-tiered system. One that says, yes, we reward for proficiency, but also we give major credit to schools who take students who do not have the backing foundations and so forth and supports. And if we can get them to graduation, that can be as remarkable a feat as even other students performing at proficiency. When we look and there's lots of data about what happens when you drop out of high school and, and income and so forth, this has to be a major fact. And when you see students like Ms. Fuller's come up through high school and still see them progress all the way to graduation, it is remarkable. And when, if we can hit proficiency, absolutely. But we have to make sure we give credit along the way. Okay, so here's the important factors. Number one, if you pay attention to nothing else, this must be the driving force behind all education. We've got to build, run, and lead schools that, to which we would send our own children. Why would you send your child to my school if I wouldn't send my own kid there? Schools cannot be for other people's kids. They must be for our own. And if that is the standard, we eliminate many of these issues. We don't allow failure to continue for 30 plus years. Secondly, I'm gonna repeat this one. Progress must be seen as a moral imperative to act, not as an excuse for inaction. And lastly, the system of urban public schools we build, fund, and lead must meet the needs for all of us without qualification. And if, in fact, we can do these things and reset our priorities, cash in some political markers, realize that capital must be shared for all of us, we can take failing schools and make them part of a successful school system that is right for all of us. Thank you.